Well, we, we're going to start off with a keynote by Patrick Weiss from Insurance Canada. Patrick's been in the business a couple of years. He's worked in uh, many different organizations, and he's got a different way of thinking about things and seeing things that I think um, it is provocative, and I think that's his goal in life. So, Patrick, come on. <laughs> Patrick Weiss, everybody. Now, um, let's see, who do I pick on? Who's, who's far enough back? Can you hear me? Okay, go on. And I'm going to do this. Because oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> provocative. <laughs> I told you, right? He's provocative. This uh, all goes back a few years. And uh, if you, if you want to, my, my sartorial uh, review, uh, my partner, Doug Grant, can probably talk about stuff that I don't want to hear. So he'll do it in private. So um, thank you very much for inviting me today, Wendy, and for uh, Orbit members and the board. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, kind of good news, bad news. Uh, the good news is a lot of this material is fresh. The bad news is I have no idea how long it's going to take. I could be done in 15 minutes. <laughs> It's highly unlikely exactly. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me. But um, uh, I will also depend upon participation. So I'm going to pause every once in a while to have just discussion. And no, please feel free all the way through to just raise your hand and say you're full of it. What you really mean is, because uh, it's a lot of it's my opinion. Okay, It's not Orbit's opinion. It's not certainly not any of the broker associations. Uh, opinion. Um, I don't think it's Doug's opinion, so it's not Insurance <laughs> Canada. Uh, so it's just me. Okay. So what uh, what the overview is? Um, three generations of the previously unthinkable. I'll talk about that. What are some of the emerging technologies, trends, and some of the stuff from Insurance 2024, as uh, uh, Wendy pointed out? Then I'm going to give you my thought about what the next generation of the previously unthinkable is, and this is. This is the fresh stuff. This is the really fresh stuff. And I'm going to try to, with your help, what does this all mean for us today? So just as a warm-up, and this is where I'm going to make one me do a little bit of work. Uh, from your perspective, thinking out five years, ten years, probably not more than that, what does the insurance industry look like? More brokers, less brokers, much more premium, much less premium, much better results, much poorer results. What are your thoughts? Sure. I think there'll be far less brokers. Fewer brokers. Fewer brokers, a lot of bigger brokers. Bigger brokers, so consolidation. Consolidation, less companies. Fewer companies. And a lot of technology. And a whole lot of technology. Hear that, Halia? Ramp up. <laughs> Halia's from IBM. How about the number of people? How about the number of total number of empl employees, Doug? Yeah. Employees. More or less, same? Less. less. Maybe mm -hmm. more actuaries. More actuaries? <laughs> Rick? As a bit of a contrarian, um, I see. Uh, to a certain degree, more employees. Uh, I believe that the hours of service are going to expand. Hours of oh, okay. Of service to the client, mm -hmm. and you really can't spread the same number of employees in the industry over the greater number of hours. There will be efficiencies made through technology, but I don't know how they're going to offset each other. I don't think any of us knows. So. Definitely de uh, more technological efficiencies, but because the consumer is demanding a greater amount of service time and our hours are going to be longer, not shorter, we're going to have to have people who are going to ban those. So you're going to finally work the full 24 hours out of the day? No. <coughs> okay. Um, but certainly 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., oh, you know, 9 to 5 on Saturday kind of thing. Okay. Um, more self-help, so That's, yeah. over overnight, those people can service themselves. But uh, there's going to be 
right now I know there are some of some brokers that are eight to eight and uh, doing through their web and they have to have somebody there to have a little chat thing on their website and, and respond. So, uh, sure. The distance between the haves and the have-nots will continue to get wider. So that's that like demographic, economic? Across every dimension. Okay. There'll be insurers who make a pile of money and oh. insurers who lose a pile of money. They'll and that's different from today because? Uh, because, <laughs> going, because going back not that far, the extreme edges of that were closer. Okay. So I think so the haves and the bigger haves spread. are getting a bigger spread, which means typically in the, again, back, you can could, you could still live and survive in the marginal. I think we're going to see winners and losers okay. start to really shake out when that, that divide starts okay. to mind. I'm going to have to wrap this. this we're going to talk a little bit about technology. A great last, last point. Uh, to your, your point, whether people are going to pay more or less for insurance, both. Uh, okay. You're going to have greater segmentation, so a certain element of the population will pay less, mm -hmm. uh, but those uh, costs will have to be picked up by the segmented against portion of the population. And that's that's it. What about what about product? And, uh, on, okay. Uh, I think that the evolution of technology in vehicles and insurance and driverless cars and things how you're doing, is going to significantly change all of the problems that we're having with Ontario Auto now. So, as a percentage of the overall premium in the marketplace, automobile is going to shrink like crazy. I think the brokers are far better positioned to look after commercial insurance than any direct ever could. So I actually okay. think it goes really well to brokers. So we're so so. Do you think there's going to be more product or less product? More. Uh, there's gonna be more. There's going to be more for less. More more types of products. More durations of products. Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, Switch to technology. What's technology going to look like? Is it going to be more ubiquitous? Is it going to be more invasive? Is it going yes. to be more? I'm not, this isn't all of the above. This isn't the main. <laughs> okay, Paul. I think if it's going to work, it's going to look like whatever the customer wants it to look like. I'm sorry? I think if it's going to work, it's going to look like whatever the customer wants it to look like. So, what the co co so it's customer driven. <clears throat> They want okay. an email once a week that gives you an update, and they'll make that selection, and that's what they'll get. They want it's going to be a big PC email. Once again, and that's what they'll get too. Okay. Self-service will allow a whole lot more. Right. Direction of your policy to the front line. Um, but I mean, the customer's going to interact with your technology whether they want to. Right. Either way around. Okay. Anything else on technology? Take mobile. Mobile. Going to have. I mean, right now it's small. I, I heard just a, a bracket. I heard something from a speaker. I have to follow it up. Something around 60% of the search traffic is driven by mobile. So small, wow. got a pretty good penetration now, but you're, I, I, I tend to agree, sure. Kim. Rip. Kim. We'll see the emergence of expert systems like IBM and Watson that become more pervasive and will interact with them. You're welcome. <laughs> For me, it's the marriage between um, the robotics and processing. Okay. So you'll get robotic processing to deliver those after hours um, uh, self-service will start to shake out what's easy and what can go through, what okay. isn't, and then it will start to be more and more and more, and it won't be handled, in my opinion, by employees staying right after how, how, I, what, 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 are brokers, what do brokers think about that, just quickly? Brokers. Right. Yeah. That's good. Well, in terms of okay, so there's going to be there's going to be more of this robotics. There's going to be more uh, analytics. Analytics. There's going to be more uh, uh, expert systems or, or artificial intelligence, depending on what what what. And you don't have to answer right now because there's actually going to be more on this later. Mm -hmm. 
but think about what does this mean for the distribution network, insurance generally and the distribution network. Just think about it. Okay. What don't we know? We don't know what we don't know. What are, what are the things you're, you're scared you're not getting enough information about? I think it's opposite. I think we're getting so much information that we don't have the time to focus on the information we're supposed to focus on. That's, so I think it's opposite. Okay, so information overload. <clears throat> we don't know how to control it. How's that sound? Or where, where to put our laser vision on. And where to, put, where to focus. So yeah. we don't know how to focus on some of this stuff. Good. We're supposed to be selling insurance, but we tend to be doing lots of other stuff other than selling insurance. Okay. So we don't know how to get back to the basics. I'm a consumer. Uh, I don't think you have enough information on the consumer. We need to have more insight into the consumer. And, and we, we maybe don't know what tools to use, or we don't know how to how to focus ourselves on that. That's a good, good point. Yep. I think that one of the banks will ever be able to sell a right to the rent. We don't know that. We don't, we don't know about, let, can, can I broaden that to alternative distributors and how they're going to be regulated? Yeah. Uh, uh, alternative vehicles, insurance vehicles and distributors mm -hmm. too. Good. Okay. And not necessarily how to market to all the new generations that are coming up. We have the X, we have the Y, we have the Millennium, we have, and now the next Digital one. natives. That's the term. That's the term. Uh, it's not mine. That's, like that's my the children term. who only know technology. How are you going to reach them? And I think you sort of, instead of technology, yep. because that's going to be the given, we have to sort of start to anticipate their okay. needs. And we have to I, I think there'll be a big change once the, you have the huge demographics make the shift. Sorry, but the, 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 the big demographics, demographics like? make the, the huge shift. Baby boomers. Come on, that's when you're going to see a big change. I'm going to miss me. Yeah. <laughs> but okay. that's when you're going to see it. And I, don't, I, I think you're right. I don't think we know uh, what information we need to know to be able to right. um, avail ourselves of all of the potential sales opportunities of your kids. Right. Yeah, I, I think we don't know that. Doug, did you? Sorry, Doug. Uh, I just couldn't hear what. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's, that's good. So we've got that recorded. If you can read it, yeah. Uh, well, we'll, 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 we're going to jump back to that at the end because some of that stuff I'm going to have some opinions on. So here we go. Uh, let's let's take a real fast trip to the present. So here's my opinion of what the uh, three generations of the previously unthinkable are. And I got a little asterisk that down here says thanks, Willie. This isn't originally my construct. This actually came from a very, very, very smart guy who may or may not still be around in the industry, Willie Jack. Anybody know Willie Jack? He ran the IT department at Aetna Casualty when it was that, and he, he went on to do other things, spent some time in Hong Kong. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll get back to Willie in a minute. But I just wanted to say, this, isn't, uh, this actually came from somebody else who's smarter than I am. So the first generation of the previously unthinkable was the mainframe computer circa the 1960s. It actually came into being a whole bunch before that, but really that's when it started to get some commercial traction. The personal computer in the 1980s, and the commercial internet in about the 1990s. All of these things, but I, those, those dates are a little bit important because what I want to do is talk, this cooperates, uh, about that. What, what is this unthinkable? So in my mind, it is the functionality that couldn't have been imagined without technology. So being able to do things that on these different platforms you couldn't do. And when the platforms came around, all of a sudden the functionality became available. And also the development of additional technology that had to be built on the back of other technologies. So you couldn't think about doing a personal computer without doing a computer. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay. This has some implications, though, and one of the implications is that technology precedes business need in some instances. Which research and development, it's the research side, that's, that's fairly straightforward. But after that, business has its opportunity to shape it and to value it. Okay, so having a personal computer back in the early 1980s was extremely valuable 
If you had one of those on your desk, you were a really, really important person, right? Because it cost, with the printer and everything else, in the neighborhood of seven to ten thousand dollars, depending on how it was configured, right? That's just what it cost. So this is a cyclical thing in my head, and it's the business IT relationship cycle again. I, this is kind of comes from me, but I also I've seen other stuff, and you'll see stuff from one of the analysts that talks about it. And this is all time. And this is kind of the impact on business and the feeling of business, the relationship between business and technology. Positive feelings, heavy utilization, that kind of stuff. Negative feelings, oh my God, you're screwing me again. And it started out with the mainframe. So that mainframe computing really came out of the Second World War in a lot of ways. Uh, with, with mechanical devices, and then all of a sudden somebody threw in some vacuum tubes and it became a computer. And all of a sudden, after a bit, people found out we can actually not only use this for academic stuff, this actually has a business purpose. So throughout the 1960s, first large and then mid-sized organizations started to acquire computing technology. And the unthinkable part about this was that prior to that, anybody who said you were going to have your own computer or access to a computer, it just wasn't thinkable. This was something a big university or the government of the United States or something like that had, but it became uh, more common within industries. And they ran a whole bunch of stuff and they were really good at repetitive processing, really good at statistical analysis. The problem was, and this is where things started to swing down, access to those resources. So not everybody had it, not every business had it, not every business had it in a way that they could get to it. So by the time I started to enter the, the computing world, there was already griping about, my God, we got to go to IT again. It's not working, we got to form a queue. First you talk to the business analyst, then you talk to the, somebody else, then you talk. All I want them to do is fix one code. So, so there was challenges to this. And that drove the evolution of personal computers in business. Personal computers, anybody here of a TRS-80? Anybody work on a TRS-80? <laughs> oh, Kim, wasn't it wonderful? You could do it. This was from Radio Shack, yeah. right? You bought it, you built it yourself, you had your own computer at home. It was wonderful. And, but you had, to try, you had to tie it in the television screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which was okay, as long as the rest of the family didn't want to do anything on, on the TV. So, but this all of a sudden, and it started to, to come forward, and IBM got involved in it, and that was the kind of first commercially oriented one. And this is, this is where Willie Jack came in. This was his brilliance. Uh, that, that, that came out. Uh, there's a bunch of us sitting around the table. I was working at Aetna at the time. A bunch of us sitting around the table having the argument of if we've got an office, a branch office, with 25 people, how many personal computers do we need? Right? Anybody who's been around that era had this discussion. Because they were maybe not 10,000, but standard about 5,000 altogether. So, well, okay, so, you know, you know, they do a lot of work on this stuff and, and whatever. Uh, maybe in 25 people we need four. Yeah, but that's not going to be enough at peak periods. Well, well, then we'll reschedule our employees. Some will start at 6 and work till 2, and some will start at 10 and work till 8 and all that. So we're going to shift the employees around. So we're going around and around and around. And, and Willie is as running the IT department, um, and he's an actuary by, by training, too said, no, you don't understand. The answer is one. What do you mean, Willie? One. One employee, <clears throat> one computer. One to one. There was a silence roughly equal to the silence here <laughs> as some people had to be resuscitated because the math went on real quick and said we would be out of business if we did. He said, no, 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 don't get confused. 
That's what's coming. You plan for what's coming, and you fill in up to that point, that, but that's what's coming, and that's what came. So that was the unthinkable sort of stuff that we all had to get over. And BC started to proliferate, not getting rid of this, but having a bigger impact because we're covering more employees directly with computing technology. All of that was great until somebody said, wait a minute, I got a spreadsheet, you got a spreadsheet, everybody's got a spreadsheet, and they're all different. How come? Well, we're not bringing them all together. Well, how do we bring them all together? Well, we take our, our, our floppy disk and we walk over here and we put it in over there. So, well, we'll do that over our network. Well, the network had, for that kind of stuff, 300 bits per second. Anybody see, ever seen 300 bits per second? Yeah, me too. I had to download a client file at 300 bits per second. We ran it over the weekend. It ran long. <laughs> it ran until the next weekend. And it just, it's that kind of stuff. So linking up personal computers, when they started to get bigger networks and more networks, and, but you still had the problem because everybody had their own standards for what the spreadsheet should look like, what the document should look like, and so the reconciliation of that. And also, there wasn't any commonality in getting information from the outside world, which is why God created the Internet. And this, all of a sudden, took a lot of the problems away because you already had built-in connectivity. You didn't have to get the operations people to build this. This started to come. But it came with its own set of problems. So instead of arguing about how many computers you need, how many people would have an email address in the office? Have you ever had that discussion? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One. And again, it's one. But it took us a while to figure that out because we hadn't made the translation. But a much bigger impact, obviously, on this. And so we thought we had hit the real gold mine. This was going to be the solution for all computing because computing was starting to happen in this cloud environment. Resources were available, lots of resources that we used to have to go to the libraries, we used to have to call up people to buy databases, those started to, to start to emerge online. All of this was, was really good and wonderful until a couple of things started to happen. This stuff hasn't gone away. We're still running our business on this, but this has turned into a marketing, this has turned into a sales vehicle, this has turned into an analytics vehicle. All of that stuff happening, so we're adding new functionality, but the business is running in the background, and roughly 1995 or so, what happened? Anybody? Okay. So he said, um, so in about, oh, say, five years, you're going to have the 2000 instead of the 19, right? In front of this two digit year. Okay? So he said, well, it might take a little work. Well, how much work? Well, and this thing uh, come, come back. Probably about six man years. For this one? Oh, yeah, but, but it'll fix three others. But not these others over here because it's a different file. The year 2000 bug, as it was called, sucked a huge amount of resource out of IT departments to do nothing but make sure. On January 1st, 2000, everything was going to work. And even if you believed it was going to, there's a lot of people out there who would scare you to death saying, are you sure? Do you really want to bet on that? And a lot of people came in to do analysis and stuff like that, and that sucked up more resources. So while the Internet was just blazing away out here, all that was going on. So at roughly 11.59 on the 31st of December, People held their breath, and two seconds later, now here's, here was my strategy. My wife and I got on an airplane. <clears throat> we flew to Hawaii, and we were having dinner. And I looked at my watch, and it was coming up to the time, and there was a whole bunch of stuff happening around the world. And we finally got through, because Hawaii sort of at the end of all of this. There's a few places that are further on. At the end of all this, the world had not come to an end. My, my strategy was that if the world had come to an end, elevators stopped working, 
heating stopped working, couldn't pump anything out, life would be a beach for me. <laughs> right? Anyway, it, we all know this all came to an end. It, however, left a little bit of a bad taste in some business people's mouths that IT had stuck it to them again. Right? As well, all of this stock that I've been buying from the dot-com companies, because they had a dot-com at the end of their name, was pretty well sort of kind of worthless. And that was kind of the end. We then hit this other patch, and we got up to the GR. The GR was uh, uh, 2007, 2008, and that was what they call the Great Recession, the Great Reset, whatever it is. Because we started to crawl back up. Now, this is where I want to validate my thinking on this with a, and at that point, I'm sorry, at that point, either stuff was going to go up or go down. And what I want to do is validate with this company called Noverica. You may have heard of them. They're an analyst firm, fairly well-respected analyst firm. They kind of map the same stuff. I don't know whether they found mine and borrowed mine or whether I slept through it and borrowed theirs, but this is, this is how we ended up. So just before the dot bombs, what that says up there uh, is CRM is going to be great because we had all figured out everything else about computing. What we're going to try to do is get to a singularity of how we're going to do customer relationship management. Then this stuff happened, and we had to rethink all of it. And the response was, IT is stupid, never ask me for money again. <laughs> okay? So the, the sidebar here is faith and expectations. Faith and expectations went to zero. Those of us who were working in the IT area, it went to zero. It really did. Uh, people were nice to you. They didn't throw you out of the building or anything. They didn't want to whole, have a whole lot to do with you unless they had to. And then about that, 2005, we realized, okay, all that stuff that we used to be thinking about that was going to be a competitive advantage, we haven't done anything on for 10 years. So you saw a big wave of things. And in our industry, it was replacing legacy systems. So we had a whole bunch of COBOL code out there from, from the mid-80s that was still running, and some still is. But we weren't able to do some of the stuff that we wanted to around it. It certainly impacted broker connectivity. Blew the hell out of claims in a couple of different places. So a company called Guidewire came along, and some of you may have heard of this. They were big on the, using the Internet to, uh, uh, to exploit new technology bringing in claim systems. So some people start to see some, some things happening. Well, if we're in the IT business, or we're in the business of information, we should really pay attention to IT. Then we got close to this great reset, and well, we're sort of, you know, we need some new capabilities because other people are getting competitive with us now. And after the great reset, what the, answer, what the response was, oh my god, oh, we, oh what is it? Obi-Wan Obi Kenobi, you're our only hope. So IT started to flourish again and rise to, to the Main Street where, where kind of we sort of sit today. So what happened after the Great Reset? We were doing legacy replacement and we started to work about work on CAMs. Anybody heard the acronym CAMs? Okay. I didn't until recently. Maybe it's from Obama. As in, yes, we cams. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <clears throat> cloud, C. So applications are resident in the cloud. Data is held in the cloud. It's outside the enterprise. This takes us back to really early mainframe days. Anybody heard about service bureaus or timeshares? Or, yeah. yeah, we're back to that. Only it's a little bit faster and probably a little richer. Pay as you go model. So cloud's big. Analytics, big. Everybody's talking about analytics. Uh, for descriptive, so understanding our business. Predictive, so we can predict what our business is going to be. And prescriptive, and this is the interesting part we started to allude to in the early conversation, where the machine says, this is what you got. This is what you might have. This is what you got to do. And it says that to the CSR. So you feed stuff in, and the CSR gets a message. This is can this is canceled. This you got to do this. You got to raise the uh, deductible. You got those those prescriptive. 
So it prescribes what we have to do. Mobile, need I say more? And social. So CAMS is the acronym is CAMS. You will you will hear this going forward. Okay. Yep. Oh, he's going to add one more. Oh, sure. One more S. Sure. Security. Oh, that. Oh, so security boring. In this new world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Did you guys hear how? Yeah. So the response was, "There's one more S, and that's security." Uh, it's it's it's, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today. But you're absolutely right. Uh, the, but the, the interesting thing about that is it's a two-edged sword. You have to spend a lot of money on it. But the industry that we're in, we can build product around this, and we are building product. Right now, I think it's writing about $2 billion in the U.S. in cyber insurance, which on a, what is it, $500 billion or something, PNC business in the U.S.? Some big number. Uh, but it's starting, it's, got, it's on a curve. Marsh just announced that they'll write uh, up to 300 million in limits and things like that. So it's, yes, there's absolute traction. With security, you're absolutely right. But what, and that's, that's interesting. What though has happened is we haven't gotten rid of the mainframes. They're still out there. All the remediation that we've done in a lot of our insurance companies is still running. TD Bank has got 1960s programs that are running. I know, I can tell, I'm a TD customer. I like them, but I can tell when I go to the stuff that they haven't upgraded. They're working on it, but it's still up. So those are what we call legacy systems. Those are legacy systems. I have a simultaneous translator. This is very good. Thank you. So we have legacy systems running on mainframes. We have personal computers with our own special little applications out there that are spinning away and working in insurance companies and brokerages. And we have internet applications combined with all this stuff. My question is, are we busy enough yet? We'll talk about that. Oops. Carrying on. So there's a, where are we now in terms of the relationship between IT and business? How many people are business people? How do you feel about IT? Raise your hand. Hi, if it's really good. Here, if it's okay. Here, if it's, you know. Beth, you're married to one. Your hand better be high. <laughs> and a whole bunch of people are saying, I'm not going to tell you because you might, you might remember me. Um, yeah. Well, here's some data points. And this guy, oh, this is, uh, uh, State Street is an investment group in the U.S. They invest insurance companies' monies money and they commissioned the economist uh, to do a survey of uh, 321 managers and executives. 78% believe that changing customer demands are driving technology investment. That's a good thing, right? 28% believe the technology strategy is fully aligned with the business strategic priorities. Mm. Frightening number. Okay, that's that says fully aligned. Okay. The next the next category said okay. somewhat aligned. Yeah. Okay. okay, that got us less than 50%. Uh, so more than half of the business managers and executives surveyed don't think that their IT strategy is aligned with the business strategy. 17% of the companies, uh, they kind of did some consolidation and found out that there were some leader companies out there, and they gave some characteristics of some of leader companies. And here's, here's three that they said were important. Innovation being rapid. We'll talk about innovation in a little bit. Innovation is one of those terms that I got tired of a while ago, and now I'm starting to get more interested in again. Mm -hmm. It, it sounded like, well, you gotta, have, you gotta innovate, you gotta innovate. Well, what does that mean? Well, you gotta innovate, to innovate. So it's one of those words that, but I, there's some companies that have gotten better at defining it, and I kind of like it a little bit more. So innovation is rapid. 82% of these leading companies agreed with that. 53% of the total population agreed that innovation was rapid in their companies. The tech managers, CIOs, etc were proactive. 70% of the leading companies found that the, uh, uh, the 
the CIOs, etc., were proactive. 23% of the total population, if you factored out the leaders, it would be lower than that. A gap. Mm -hmm. Business managers actually exploited, business managers actually used and encouraged the use of new technology. Leading companies, 69%. Total respondents, 22%. Gap. Yes? Uh, so Patrick, is there any evidence that shows that if you're a leader, that your business results are better? Uh, yeah, that's actually in there, you, and you'll find it. I, I'm sorry, I should, I should have put that up, but you're right. Uh, it, go, go Google State Street, and this is on their, on their site. Uh, you, get, you get the full report. They're really good about stuff like that. Yes, is the short answer. And were any insurance companies in those uh, leading companies? Oh, this is all insurers. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this is of insurance companies. This whole survey was oh, of insurance, insurance companies. companies. U.S. Really? Really. I missed that. I'm thinking in the world. Now, okay. Wow. Yeah. Kind of hits your back nerve, doesn't it? I'm not sure I support those findings. Actually. Well, they're trying to sell you something. Wow. Okay. Hang on. Okay. Hold that thought. So, <laughs> these are what? Sorry, what was that last word? Pause. Pause. So, let's take a pause. Groan. <laughs> you were saying? No, I mean, you can, you can set the, uh, the stats to suit your, what you're trying to sell, right? Yeah, I don't think, well, State Street is an investment banker, so I'm not sure why they were trying to do anything like that. I sense, this is my sense, that we're kind of, as, as that curve has gone up, that there's a, high, a greater degree of suspicion of IT now than there was two, three, four years ago. I get that impression. And that's just my own impression. Now, it may be that I'm filtering it and I'm presenting you with this as opposed to other stuff. But um, this kind of validates that to me and other stuff I've read. Yes. So long before I sold technology, when I was still a young student, I actually did my master's thesis on adoption of technology by brokers. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I'd love this to was that. so long ago that you wouldn't even relate to the technology that was out there. But it, it proved the same thing that... <laughs> but she's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope not, I hope not, because most of the, the okay, some of the mind. stuff that was sold was being used as almost freezers or just tables in an office there. <laughs> putting stuff on the computer, but um, it, it really did show that the bigger brokers, the more successful ones, were adopting technology and using it and taking the time to leverage it versus the smaller guys who kind of tried and just put it aside because it was just too much of an effort. And it, you know, it, it's a and resource that, thing, it's an investment thing. That's it. It's a interesting point. Point. It's about cost, too. That's right. I mean, the cost of the drop dramatically. Well, but if you start to look at your total costs yes. within the operation, including the people who have to keep these things warm and safe and happy to run, it's hard to tell. It's very difficult to tell. Second, Deb? So, two things. So, back in the mid 90s, all right, when you have the upswell going, the one thing I wanted to add is lots of people bought applications. But Y2K meant they couldn't actually use them. They hadn't actually really rolled them up. Yes. They thought about, I need technology, man. I need technology. I'm yep. losing it. Right? It's the middle of the 90s. People are buying like crazy. Y2K comes along. Um, you have the big nothing occurs. Um, and then immediately afterwards, most vendors will recall the years following Y2K. No hungry. Right. Nobody buying anything. And the big manager was, I bought all this stuff already. Could you help me try to figure out how to actually use it? Right. And, and, that, and that's true. And like that, was, that, was, that was a big... The, so the, the, there had been an acquisition of a bunch of assets that people just had to put on, on hold, put on pause, to wait until they had some resources who could implement the stuff. You're absolutely right. Right. So I'm just saying you were validating the, the bubble and the drop. Yeah. And I think that bought a bunch of stuff in the bubble but then couldn't implement it added to your drop. So I right. just wanted to add that point to it in, in a couple places. And I think in some ways, we're there again. And that's, okay, hello. Okay, so there was another round of evolution in technology that took place. 
Yeah. And, but what I think the difference now is that kind of issue about suspicion coming now, if, if that's the right word, is that the systems are bigger and better and more complex, and so they break better. Mm -hmm. When they break, it's they break huge. Good. It's <clears throat> a million people's credit card information has been breached. It's yeah. medical information posted, people's personal pictures posted out on the internet, that kind of stuff. So I think that whole they break better is part of that concern, which says, yeah. well, maybe I really don't want a great big, you know, world domination strategy right. uh, technology because if it breaks, I'm in deep trouble. Maybe I can just do something in yeah. my own world. Anyway, that's a, that's a thought. So I'm gonna I'm gonna press on so we can have be out in time okay. for lunch. Oh, you have your hand up. That's all. Are you okay, Holly? Do you do you have I, a quick point? I, I think Covered it? My okay. My question was going to be why the suspicion at this time? I'm sorry? Why what? Why the suspicion of IT? Why, why the suspicion at this time? Yeah. Um, I'm not, I think that we're, 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 the business people are getting smarter about doing return on investment stuff and not necessarily picking up the first, <clears throat> the first iteration. They're actually challenging these things and saying, so what are your assumptions? And, and the assumptions, right now I think we're on a really shaky earth to, to, to make some of the assumptions that we're making. We talked about earlier. Are we going to have more brokers, less brokers? And that's all part of this assumption stuff. Just, yeah, okay, last point, we're going to move on. I think the, the fear and the suspicion issues are because there's been some mass transformations that have gone awry because it's yes. miscalculated budgets. People say yep. it's going to take two years, it takes five. Yep. It's going to cost 10 million, it costs 40 million. Yep. Boards, like boards of just, directors are really watching this stuff. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Because these are big. Way off. Right? And it, it has to do with the legacy transformation, so must do, but how do you do it in a reasonable way? And, and this, and brokers are not immune from That's just going to say that, yeah. There, I've heard through the grapevine that there are sometimes some implementations that don't go all that well. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't It doesn't make, you know, the news as much as some of the, the bigger flops that we've had, and I'm not mentioning names in it, but there have been some big flops. Uh, but it's to you as business people is probably more impactful. Anyway, I'm going to continue. So some some trends. What's Moore's law? Quick. Data and data processing doubles every 18 months. So anything relating to data processing doubles every 18 to 24 months is, is generally the rule. Not so, supervised Rick notes. Uh, <laughs> so computer resources, all that kind of stuff, double or or speed cut in half every 18 months. Okay. Geometric curve. Okay. SMA, which is another analyst firm, has declared that Moore's law has been repealed. <laughs> okay. It's irrelevant, is what they say, compared to the power of emerging technologies. There is it, this doubling; we can't even pay attention to it anymore because it could be doubling every week. With some of the stuff that's coming along, because it's faster, they're more formidable, more <clears throat> business-oriented than ever before. Okay, and here's some examples of what those things are. Um, so the Internet of Things, which we'll talk about, hits a tipping point in 2017 and is in ubiquitous use by 2021. This is their estimation based upon some good work I think they've done. Who's got wearable devices on right now? Fitbits? Nobody? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So those things it's a tipping point, which is 30% in a uh, uh, year and a half a bit. Ubiquitous use by 2021. Drones. Now, why the hell would we be interested in drones? I don't know, but Iran is very keen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's some people in the downtown New York condos that are pretty keen, too, but it's different reasons. State Farm and, State Farm and uh, U.S. insurance companies are interested. Very interesting. For claims. For claims. Yeah. Well, it's same day delivery from Amazon. That's what they're talking about. Well, yeah. they're, same day delivery, but but the claims implications are pretty good too. So if you have a plane crash and things are still smoking, yeah. you want to maybe put something in, you know, that you can replace at the store as opposed to getting birthed, you know. Uh, you you want to do stuff like that to get in as soon as possible, find out what the hell happened. Yeah. It's also really good for underwriting really tall buildings as opposed to having somebody hang outside and look at the, the seams in the buildings. Mm -hmm. That kind of stuff. Ubiquitous use uh, around 2020 as well. Artificial intelligence we talked about. 
uh, comes in 2024. So these are all different technologies that are coming together at the same time. What, what are semantic technologies? Uh, I'm going to let, I'm going to, who, who wants to answer it, Clinton? <laughs> this is a, okay, this is a oh, go for it, John. Yeah, so this is a techie stuff. Today when you search on the internet, it looks at the terms that you've used and it tries to find match for those terms. But in a semantic world, it tries to understand what you're actually trying to do and search for that. Right. So really it's about uh, the internet knowing what you're thinking. Well, it's part of, part of the internet, but, but it, to, to generalize, it, it takes these questions in context as opposed to the question itself. So it builds yeah, contextual context. information around. It's, it's pretty geeky, but it's pretty important. <laughs> Uh, and 3D printing, 3D printing. Uh, it's I mean you can buy. I think I saw the cheapest one I saw recently was about uh, eight hundred dollars or something. Wow. In a catalog for a 3D printer. These are the things that you know if you want to if you want to replace a bumper you pour in some some pretty good plastic stuff. You want to replace a liver you got to find some other fluid to pour in and then it prints. <laughs> The semantic technology? Yeah. Um, no, it's it's going to generate big data, <clears throat> for sure. It works on big data. Um, the stuff that's going to generate big data are driverless vehicles, yeah. uh, uh, drones, wearable devices. Life insurers are really keen on some of this stuff. Health, life and health insurers. That's what's coming. So all of these are, are going to focusing on insurance, um, and this is going to create more busy. What do we do with this stuff? Well, well our competitors are doing stuff. Sorry. Uh, you said to your point earlier, which is, even though these things are not going to hit tipping points or be ubiquitous, the stuff that is used to make a driverless vehicle, the technology, that technology is out today. Oh, yeah. Right? Even though the driverless vehicle is not necessarily out or all of these pieces are not necessarily out. The actual underlying technology is all out there, and right. it's going to find different ways than that into, into our lives, right. right, as well as them. Lots of implications of this stuff. So here's the Internet of Things. This is just how all of this stuff kind of fits together. You can't see this up here, but uh, the, these are things that have network sensors, things like cars. We all have, we have a lot of sensors in our cars already whether we're using telematics or not. Uh, but at home, anybody have Nest in their home yet? There's new Nest technology, smart thermostats, and that kind of stuff. There's a bunch of this stuff that's, that's coming out. And, you know, Fitbits for walking and keeping, keeping track. But you connect these two, this is kind of, well, I'll come to that at the end. Um, so that creates a whole bunch of data, really, really big data. I mean, telematic stuff you measure in the seconds or milliseconds of stuff being transmitted, right? So big, big data and put it into some sort of storage and it's not just data, it's, it's text and images and videos and all this kind of stuff. Okay, then you need some analytic engines that are going to work on that and iterate back and forth to come to some things when we start talking about the semantic technologies and then provide feedback. So the Internet of Things says that there's going to be machine-to-machine -machine communication and it's going to be ubiquitous in, in some, some years or so. And we have to think about what does that mean for, for insurance and it means, I think, a whole lot. What is insurance going to look like in, in 2024? This comes from various presentations. Mature markets are going to commoditize. So all, a lot of stuff, small commercial, Personal lines, a lot of that stuff, just pure commodity, even more so than now. That's the that's the feeling. This stuff that's come out. Uh, there's going to be a net loss of, in, of risk premium. Okay, on, on especially on auto and some other lines. Growth is going to come from new segments, cyber risk being one, but there's going to be some others. People talked about just-in-time insurance. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example of what that looks like. Prospective, not retrospective risk management. There's too many syllables in those words. I don't know what it means. But this is, this is where you can have variable risk profiles. You've got a Fitbit on this. You go into life or health insurance. You've got a Fitbit on. It detects that you're not living up to what you said you do. Your premiums go up. Okay? And there could be just-in-time stuff. 
They could write contracts that do this. You want cheap insurance? You say you do these things, that's fine, we'll just monitor you for a while. How's that sound? Telematics. And the telematics does the same thing. And there's a focus on the independent distributor. So the answer there is there's going to be better need for independent distributors from at least a couple of the panelists. Because somebody's going to have to explain this crap to the customer. I mean, the, the people sitting back at home trying to figure out, I, I, started, I started this business in the life side with Aetna. I think I, I mentioned that. They were very creative in putting product together. It was really, really interesting life insurance product. Um, and, uh, but they couldn't explain it. So their, their MGAs got really good at explaining it and made a lot of money. So PPI kind of started their part of their trajectory going up uh, uh, with Aetna and some of the very complex products. Okay. And greater collaboration, we hope. Between who, when you say that? Uh, well, the, the, the feeling was there's going to have to be greater collaboration, obviously, between, between brokers and companies to really understand this stuff, but there's also going to be greater collaboration within the industry to start to standardize some of the data that's happening. So here's an example of some uh, new insurance product. Crop insurance. That's pretty boring, eh? Unless you get two Googlers taking a look at what can we do with this thing. Because that's a really complicated thing to settle claims on. Right? Did you really lose that much corn? You know, you're telling me it's, it's um, 10,000 bushels. Well, I've, I've counted and uh, there's only 998. Uh, whatever, you know, that, that's the kind of way we, and we spend a lot of time adjudicating that stuff. So it's founded by two ex-Googlers. Crunches massive amounts of data. Massive amounts. On climate models, weather measurements, billions of soil observations, and productivity, generally. So they know if you've got this combination of elements, you're going to have this amount of productivity. They have developed 50 terabytes of live data. That's, that's more than I can count. <laughs> the policies are for specific plantings. So you're planting corn over here, you're planting wheat over there, you've done this, 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 and this, you record it, they throw it into their model, they say, okay, your expectation is 10% more than last year because the product is that much better. And they pay on an event. An event happens, washes out the crop, they pay based on what they know. They don't go out and look at it. They pay based on that. Okay. These are the types of things that are coming out. There's another one that's actually been Berkshire Hath Hathaway. I'm going to try to keep this going. Berkshire Hathaway um, uh, is, doesn't like to invest in technology. They've said that. Except they buy a lot of insurance companies. <clears throat> and they, they've got an insurance company going, Doug, do you remember what the name of that thing was? Oh, right. Um, it's, uh, it's travel insurance with a different spin. Right. What was the name of that? I can look it up. I'll, I'll, it'll be in the Orbit Bulletin or something coming up. Anyway, what, what this does, you buy, you buy this policy, I think it's $25 per trip, right? So you're sitting on the airplane, yeah. you got a connection in Philadelphia, and they know about this because you've registered and, you, and they can go on and find this out. They find out the plane has been on the ground for two hours, you're going to miss your connection. Okay? The combination of those two elements has got $500 in your bank account. Yeah. Let me repeat that. Yeah. You're sitting on the airplane, you're going to miss your connection, the policy says you get $500 put in your bank account, and it'll be in your bank account by the time you land for your $25 investment. Mm -hmm. and, and there's scales of different things that happen. If you lose your baggage, if your baggage is gone, and they don't have to, you don't have to tell them, because this is all recorded, and you get ac they get access to this information. Mm -hmm. Was it $500 or some number yeah, like that? Yeah, it's your bank account, $1,000, something yeah. like that. It's your bank account. And this is for a company who doesn't like technology. All technology driven. 
and they pay on the event, they don't pay on the consequences. <coughs> really radical change in the insurance business model. But it could be the future of insurance, or a portion of it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, and then the Googlers sold out for close to a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that too. Oh. So the customer, this is from uh, Peter Pekaitis from IBM at our uh, event, is not your customer alone. <laughs> Nobody owns the customer, and what, what Peter said, best in class experience had in one industry is now the expectation for all industries that a customer deals with. If I've had a good relationship with you in a customer environment, I will judge the same that any other relationships based on that. So if, if my bank can turn around a uh, line of credit <coughs> application in 24 hours, I don't know why the credit insurance is taking so long. Okay, that's just, that's, that's where we're going with customer, according to Peter, and I tend to agree. He also came up with this stat, I didn't see a reference to it, but it is pretty dramatic. Uh, IBM does surveys of uh, leading uh, executives, just all in all industries around the world. 80% of the CEOs think that they deliver a superior uh, customer's uh, uh, experience. 8% of the customers agree. Uh, distribution 2024, we talked about that. Now this was a really interesting AIG presentation. Yeah. And I'm not going to get it completely perfect, but this is my thoughts on it. Social distribution networks with brokers heavily involved in the process. Okay? And you work with them like you work with people on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on that kind of stuff. So you get to know different people. Different people present themselves to be invited into your circle. You can accept or reject. That kind of stuff. All a relationship. But you, as brokers, your value add is you bring customers into that network. And you can advise them through that network. And you can introduce them to AIG who will present their very complicated products. And they are, some of them pretty complicated. And you will be part of that. Um, it's all relationship focused and they, uh, the, the premium is based upon the communications with those people. So the amount of activity and the results. And what you're communicating to them. That's what the important thing is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We would love to get this guy for our May real time days. Man, this was so eye opening. It was, he, and, and, and this is working stuff right yes. now. I saw this, pre, it, and it's all just, I'm not giving a plug to anybody. This is all based upon Salesforce. Anybody use Salesforce? Yeah. Okay. Salesforce is a platform for customer relationship management, <clears throat> but it is much bigger. Uh, it's all based upon Salesforce technology, but the thinking behind it is absolutely brilliant. I saw this at their conference, the Salesforce conference a year ago, the same guy who did it. Um, and I went up and I said, you are creating the new Lloyds, right? Because you're inviting customers into your coffee house, you're inviting brokers into your coffee house, you're inviting the risk um, uh, owners into the coffee house, and you're introducing them to make deals on, on how you're going to arrange the cover. Okay. Um, part of your responsibility also is to keep track of big data. Just a little thing, just thrown in there. You better understand your customer base as well as, as any analytic company can. Pressing on to what I think is going to happen. What's going to drive the fourth generation? Big data, big networks, analytics, new business models, and the inability, and this is the key, the inability of knowledge workers to exploit data analytics and networking in an actionable time frame. If we say to our employees, here's all this stuff, here's this tool, here's a spreadsheet, you tell me what the trends are, then we're going to be working the 24 hours. And if we're not working the 24 hours, we're not keeping up. If you assume that there's some innovation needed to get greater capacity for yeah, knowledge workers, cognitive computing may be the answer. This is the start to listen to a cognitive computing. You're going to hear it more. In a dynamic, information rich, and shifting situation, data tends to frequently change and often be conflicting. You ever run across that? Yeah. Yeah. He was a good driver yesterday. Now he's 
now he's weaving all over the highway. What's going on? Oh, maybe they swap phones. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's changing. Cognitive computing synthesizes not just the information sources, but some of the influences and contexts around it. So they take all of these different things into effect. Oh, this, this happens once a month after he has to pay for all the bills, or whatever it is, hmm. right? So these systems that are coming along on cognitive computing, and I'm not an expert, I want to learn more about this stuff, and I'm sure that Halia will help me understand it. They will provide not the right answer, but the best answer in the circumstances, and allow knowledge workers to make decisions based upon, here's what we really think this is the answer. Okay, so the, the, the classic, uh, the, the one that's most prominent, uh, IBM's Watson, remember Jeopardy? Yeah. The computer that beat all the guys on Jeopardy? That's cognitive computing. Uh, it's in production with a lot of medical companies in the United <laughs> States right now to work on that simple stuff called curing cancer. And they're actually having some success. Yeah. Treating and curing cancer. Complicated stuff. They've entered the PNC business with a very, very, very smart company in the U.S. called USAA. If you haven't heard about them, happy to talk to you about it on the break. Clinton's nodding his head. I'm sure Holly would be happy to talk to you. Deb is familiar with them. Very interesting company, USAA. I think that's the fourth generation because it's substantially different. It's taking everything we've brought to date and it's bringing it into a meaningful fashion for knowledge workers to use. That's my belief in the fourth generation. That's the hump of people are saying it's not possible. I make a better decision than a computer. All this, uh, true, probably. It may not be effective. You may get the best answer, but it's going to be out of time. Right? So what's all this mean? Uh, you got to know your customers, communicate using their preferred methods, but knowing their, your customers means greater reliance on analytics. I think 24 by 7 is what's going to happen. I think that's where we're going to be. Every broker is going to have to have some facility to handle things 24 by 7. Just saying. But it doesn't necessarily need to be a human. It may not be a human. Maybe a, maybe a, you got to run an efficient operation. I think. Uh, anybody sitting in this room does, otherwise they wouldn't have time to come here <laughs> and learn how to be more efficient. Uh, seek efficiencies from the partners, but what else can you do? And this is, I think, learn more about CAMS, especially mobile and analytics. I think those are the two big elements that if you're not familiar with the penetration of mobile, if you don't have a mobile-friendly site for your customers, those are things you're going to have to work on. And analytics Talk to your broker management vendor. What can I do to get to know my customers and my, and my markets better? Uh, segment your book. You're going to have to learn. People are going to have to specialize. Generalists, there's going to be a need, but you're going to have to specialize someplace and determine how this is all going to be packaged and marketed. Discuss this with your markets. Involve your staff and all of the above. I think that's, that's you're, you're probably doing that now. And now we can have time to chat if Devona lets me for a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then probably time for refreshments. It is. Yeah. I actually get the time. The awesome have to. I I I I am more than happy to chat. We can do it over coffee or we can Yep. Yeah. Questions uh, though? Your your point was bang on about mobility in that don't think a portal is a good application to use. On a mobile device, you have to have a mobile app to really have an end user be able to use your facility. So portal doesn't need full mobile app. Yeah. And without sounding too much like plugging, I found a really interesting guy who talks about broker portals, uh, broker mobility applications, who just might be in the same place on March 9th. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Other questions? Rick? Um, one of the things, and I mean, our business operations in the last five years don't really resemble each other. So I, I do understand there are, are things changing, but one of the 
One of the pitfalls, I think, at looking at some of this stuff is to look at what could be and what in other places is. Mm -hmm. uh, un unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for brokers, because it creates undue complexity. Certain things like the automobile product is governed not by what we would like to do, by what we think would be the best for the customer, but approximately five competing special interest groups that the government has to weigh off against each other, which keeps it complex, which does things like... Um, 30 seconds, right? Okay, so the whole talk about drivers, driverless cars. First of all, it's being developed in California where it's sunny 360 days a year. Absolutely. 70% of the accidents probably occur in the winter months. Driverless technology in winter cars is not going to happen anywhere near the same rate as it is in the sun, sunny areas. So those things for here, our business is local. I, and I agree. So but, but, but just, just on, on one thing on driverless thing, yeah. I said driverless vehicles, yeah. cars are a subset. Yeah. One of the biggest implementations of driverless vehicles now are in Fort McMurray with those great big dump trucks. They plan those routes. <coughs> yes, and they, yes. And snow, power, snow. Yeah, react to weather conditions. Yeah. But I'm just saying. Absolutely. Okay, so so there's so, there's uh, pay attention to driverless right. vehicles, yeah. not yeah. necessarily driverless cars. Right. But they may not be driverless on the highway. Oh, I know clearly. Yeah. And uh, th th there's a whole bunch of stuff around this, and it's, it's a great yeah. debate. Great. Thank you again. Thank you, Mike.